Another is the, is the, has been working also as research curator for the current exhibition, and she's the person I've been in conversation with, I don't know what it feels like now, um, about toxic and particularly waste. I mean, her background is actually as an architect, and who also has worked in waste management for the city uh, of Stockholm. So in a way also really comes from the world of policy and bureaucracy and what it means also to translate the ideas into actual city practices. And I think it's also thanks to her that I think this fascination also with the uh, ways in which we relate to waste that I think very much then also emerges back in the exhibition as to how we want to just you know, get rid of or deem visible whatever we actually don't want or dislike, the fact that we don't live with it, we just send it off somewhere else where it's possibly, yeah, um, we don't have to take care of it anymore, but also as actually we've been brought it, bringing up very often, it's kind of like out of sight, out of mind mentality that in a way seems to really guide uh, the ways in which we deal with place, toxicity, and in a way maybe in this sense anything toxic on a material as much as a metaphorical. Um, she's been working now for quite some time on a very, very particular case uh, that she will talk about. And, uh, plus, yeah, thank you for coming. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, I actually just arrived back from Scotland. I've been spending four months with my husband and three kids on a small island in the Outer Hebrides doing kind of it's, uh, my husband's a documentary filmmaker and we kind of started this as a family project four years back to we became very fascinated with a small island group off, off of Sky or off the mainland in, uh, in the western Hebrides and uh, now we went for an extended um, stay to also do sort of the first leg of um, filming I will just show uh, because we put together a my husband put together a teaser because it's going and now pushing it towards uh, trying to get it on TV and I think you also have to understand the sort of audience this is being uh, catering to and um, I mean we have a double production in, in Cologne and in Scotland and the Scotland side really would like it to be on TV whilst the, um, the German production is going to be more cinema art also. but this is anyways the sort of um, I think it's quite good at setting the tone, and then I can explain a little bit more what um, what what about it that I'm doing. Yeah, so I'm I 
also need to complete the event if I were to be I would have got the castle with them, but they're not the kind of right body to be looking after this historic building. Now this is six feet or thereabouts from uh, when we build the heart of the heritage of this building. For me, it's very much like the Grand Hall, which is more like the same building. And we've got a boundary we have, I think, um, to address this kind of damage. Most of the crofters and farmers that we don't think with the help of Sussex District. I am always quite keen to leave. My son was very much in Romania because the farm had the cultural promise of his being such a great really contributor to the farm. I don't know it's terrible, but I'm going to have to rule it. Fifty years ago, it would be a big part of our income. Sometimes they would send them off and And the middle of the way, how many fish farmers on the pollution it creates and the devastation of the sea body is completely contrary to the ethos of respecting the, the environment. It certainly has no adverse impact. My good Lord Ops has declared as well, I don't know who it is. It certainly is a serious impact. Two people in the world in the island, one from time and one part time. So that's good. And then we have to have more posts to see for this to expand. There's a lot of markets which are on the day. There are more major blessings than all of us. So both of us are both of them. It's a sign that we prefer it to be both of them. There is one. fascinated by the humans in the story, the kind of, to put it, understandably, these are the small islands. These are these four islands um, off the west coast of Scotland, and each you were introduced to Muck, Egg, and Rum. Muck is a private island owned for generations and generations. That was this old man that spoke. Egg was a buyout in the it's now a 20 year anniversary where everyone took over and now they run it as a community trust. RUM is a NSH, which is a, is a, a natural reserve almost, a, a red deer project. And then the last one is Kana, who is who's not now represented in this uh, trailer, which is more cultural heritage. And what is what fascinated us with these islands that we spent an extended amount of time on three years back is that the kind of conditions that they all are exposed to, the 
the same water, the same air, the same kind of geological um, resources, um, their position are all the same, but yet they look extremely different, they feel extremely different, and they run extremely different, and um, I find it as a, as, a, as a thinking model, it's been a, a super helpful tool to think through concepts of, for example, toxicity, where you also have a very clear ordering of what you manage the whole time. But then the big antagonist in this whole story is fish farming at the moment. It's a, it's a big kind of um, exploitative, um, which is not always, it's not a clear um, bad guy. They're actually following laws and regulations. They are providing jobs. They are providing residents. Most of these islands would actually, in this current moment, not exist. Would it not be for this fish farm? Um, so I think I kind of taken on to thinking around the salmon as opposed to sort of the human government, and that's what I've been engaging myself with during this extended stay. Um, so I don't know if you guys are familiar with this type of fish farming, but it's uh, similar to hatcheries. You know, salmon is a, is a big migratory migration fish, it needs to roam. It hatches itself in a river where it grows. It gets big enough to travel down into the ocean and makes a huge round in the Atlantic and the Pacific. It eats, it eats, it eats, and then it makes its way back. And then it climbs up the river that it was meditated to where it then dies. So it, it's a, it's, it has a very, um, it's a very vernacular and very situated species. And also, depending on which river they are born, they also look very different. You know, do you have a, a river that is steep, then you get a very powerful salmon that has to make its way up a, a big, you know, cascade of water, whilst if it's a smaller one, it doesn't have to become so strong, and so on. What is now happening in many of these uh, and kind of how they have to actually, this is their last night before death, where they make their way back to die. Um, but what has been happening since uh, the last you know, 50 years is that humans have started tinkering in this business of their own. So they were finding that there were too few salmon being hatched, or they felt a decline of salmon. So they started doing hatcheries where they actually take, they in, kind of interfere in the life of the salmon, take the, the mother taking her eggs, move it to a kind of sterile environment and produce and fertilize the eggs that they then go and plant in the rivers to make sure that they're more. Um, which, yeah. fish farming is similar. There you take a fish and you put it into the ocean where it should eat and you feed it so it grows, um, but with also very bad effects at this very moment. And I compare it very much here, you can see just different species of salmon and how they actually uh, What is actually happening now is that a certain salmon, I mean, usually when you discuss these fish farms, the thing that people talk about is the, the bad manures, the food poisoning, you know, the food all the chemicals that are extracted because these are kind of netted, open structures that you know are porous to the water that goes in and out. But the kind of big contamination that is happening at the moment is that these certain species of salmon are regularly escaping these confinements and starting to mate with wild salmon. And to a degree, <laughs> that wild salmon have kind of lost its ability to be a salmon. So it's a very slow, incremental degradation of species of salmon being a salmon because that's what they need to do. They need to climb back into the river and die. Um, and there are huge, uh, they've had huge problems of, uh, I show later in here, um, for example, placing huge pens of Atlantic salmon in the Pacific. They would have these huge, and to have an Atlantic and a Pacific salmon, I mean, just from the looks of it, you understand they are very you know, native to their environment. There was a huge 
um, I think there was like 300,000 plus, and it doesn't sound so much, but that small kind of dilution of their um, abilities to, you know, their DNA, their competitiveness to be themselves, is slowly affecting it to a certain extent right now that there are new wild salmons to be found, actually. Um, we did a lot of talking to the fishermen in, in these areas, and normal commercial fishing is pretty much gone now. I mean, this way of farming not only takes, you think it's quite invasive, it's quite invisible, you don't see it, it's pretty neat, you can still balance it with tourism because it's not so. Um, you know, it's not a, they, all, for example, have formed mining in this region, and then you have a beautiful mountain with a big spar in it where you mine, and then they realize that that's a trade off for a kind of tourism or a kind of other resource that, um, that uh, could be of you know, life, life for the And these are also this. I think the ones that you see media, sea lions, it's a kind of parasite that now breeds in these pools because of keeping them so condensed in one space, these parasites just thrive. And these parasites are then also with the species transported, so you're just seeing mutated something. And which I find, I mean, the, 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 the last man talking in this uh, teaser, he's a, he's a man, I feel one of the wisest people I've met around in those islands where he talks about salmon is just for the rich people. I mean, this is very symptomatic of a kind of market price of salmon. People are not willing to pay for a salmon to live a proper life. So this is the effect. And so, I mean, it's sort of understanding these scale, scalar effects of small communities to a very global market. Which is... These are sea lights. Sorry, it's really bad. So the image, you see, it's like fleshy. They're parasites that. Yeah, exactly. You see them in the back too. These parasites just eat into the salmon. So you, I mean, when you would see these salmon being fished out of these, you wouldn't really feel passionate about eating them. But I mean, we just know salmon in little packaged plastic pieces. A bit ignorant of kind of what their skin looks like. Where they were chopped into bits. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a there's a very nice tension also with water as a I mean Simona, the researchers worked with these three here, talked about kind of the ocean as the ultimate sink, which it has been historically. It's a place where we forget, we put things away. And I think salmon the speed we don't see them and we don't experience we see the kind of package product products of them being submitted as and to also understand how salmon, I mean, from, from, I mean, native peoples that have also grown with salmon, like communities that live around streams that wait for this, you know, that care for their salmon and make sure that they come back and live in symbiosis, like these communities are completely dying out because there's no salmon to be, to subside, like, no subsistence. Which is um, similar to what sheep farming is. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's the same type, but it's, it's, a, it's an ad domesticated animal, um, which is, at the moment, the industry that is dictating life in these islands and also shaping the landscapes and sort of cut lawns <laughs> and fencing, um, but also have different breeds that are put next to each other in pens. Shaped. I mean, this was just outside the house where we were living, and I would always stand there and look at this. <laughs> this found it so fascinating as a kind of bordering of, of um, kind of human design of saying this is what we, or how you make a relationship to other species and how those species then like orchestrate landscapes and environments that you live in. I mean, these these landscapes are now going to disappear. Effectively, when the when the when Brexit goes through, in the way it goes through, most likely because all the agricultural funding has just been rigged to keep this type of landscape alive. Um, and I think this is this kind of subtle feeling that I had. Also, it was actually on the plane on the way here when 
I looked out and I was so just kind of flabbergasted. I think I mean this most people in the Netherlands of a kind of relationship of cultivation that that is produced here is very visible because it is the ground. But to understand these extremely invisible and very complex causal chains that are at the moment happening in our oceans and understanding what fragile ecologies that we are tinkering with at the moment. Um, I mean, they have effectively with the fall of all kind of wild fish come also the fall of all types of whales. And so I find this kind of curiosity that we can continue with a kind of salmon farming because it's also invisible, even though it's right next door, you know, and, and, and to, to understand this mechanism. So I, in, in, in a bigger sense, I think I have been using these islands also as a way to think through movement, resources, and governance. Because, for example, a, the, what I call the hippie island, they're extremely ideological. They were fundamentally against having any type of fish farming, as opposed to Muck, who is a very pragmatic island, who will take it, and now they work, they flourish, they're good. But in the end, it's the same kind of couple of resources that you walk in, and so it kind of becomes ironic in a sense of human exception, believing that there's such a big kind of impact in the way that we govern or uh, elaborate on governing structures when the sort of massive causal chains of our way of being is fundamentally just going to fix what I mean, maybe not, but I, I, I found this extended stay in such a remote area where you have X amount of actors makes these things extremely visible. That said, there's agriculture also on this island, like this sheep farming. And, you know, waste is constantly produced from agricultural business. And at the moment, you have farmers burning plastics because they're not allowed to ship them back on the boats on the way back, doing that completely for themselves. And then, you, because I, I, you know, I drove past where people were just kind of happily burning outdoors, and it made me really humble to this idea of scale and concentration. Like, how do you balance this? I know that in these three research, they work on something called the ghost acre. That is, when the ultimate dump of waste or bad is so concentrated that it kind of makes life non-existent in that kind of spot. It becomes wasteland. Here, because humans are in such a minority, and because nature is so big and historically has been, like populations have never flourished here. The, the, the climate and the environment is just too uh, adverse. It's not good for humans, in a sense. And then somehow you're balancing this concentration. So if you, know, you have a fish pool that escapes a little bit of, um, of, of, of manure chemicals, or if you have someone burning up their garbage, it's, it's not impactful, you know, it doesn't produce that ultimate thing, but it's also, it's about scale, and it's about the concentration of that. I mean, I'm, uh, I, actually, on the way here, while I was looking at that landscape, and I was going to mention it, talking to some people here earlier, I was uh, listening to a, a podcast, a philosophy podcast about Derek Parfit that talks about the sort of the new ethical project balancing self interest and like longer causal effects. Like how to what extent will I empathize away from myself and my kin? Like how big is my radius of understanding and actual sacrifice in a kind of bigger moral <laughs> or ethical project? And I think that this makes it very graspable to understand certain ideological moves or certain... I'm very happy if you ask me a question because I think you just like a wrap up. From this to here where I've been kind of 
in relation to 160 individuals has been kind of my life in the school of eight people. And it's a uh, scale of concentration becomes extremely obvious when you sort of hit <laughs> I mean, or we just move on and then we can maybe have a talk around later. Yeah, Kana was not represented because there was, we had problems because they're actually in a decision to be making this fish farm. Like they want to make, they want to accept the fish farms at the moment, so they actually do not want. To and so so they it's all on the other sides. They want to have fish farms, so they're in a decision process with that. And the owners of that island, which is the cultural foundation, who are cultural trust, uh, do not want to because fish farming is such a. And it's subsidized by the EU, and that's why it's fish farming. No, no, it's a good industry. It's a good, like this multinational, like the fish, people's demand for fish is big enough that it has money. But you were talking about something about subsidies before. Yes, yeah, sheep farming. Sheep farming. Ah, sheep farming. So sheep, like, I mean, what we are also kind of willing to pay for lamb. So one lamb in this area, they, they sell for 40 pounds. So the island that we stayed with, 160 residents, had, I don't know, six, at, at best, Six or between five and six hundred lambs to sell each year that would then split between, I don't know, six to eight shareholders. So you understand the economy of it. But you know, it's lamb from here, and these lambs are great. You know, it's fantastic to sort of, you know, like where our house was situated, we just had lambs and sheep because it was lamb season also when we came. Um, these lambs are fantastically happy. Um, you know, they just roam the months all day um, around. And, um, but I mean, the price that we are willing to pay for it on the kind of global market is, is, is not comparable to what the big fat love is going to be. Which is similar to I mean, if you would actually go into you know, like the, the fishing of a wild salmon, it's, it's, a, it's a weird sport. And now you just kind of dump them. I mean, it's kind of sad that you have it. You know, sad that you sort of. Cry, laugh and cry to think that we just put them all in the pen and then we fish them out like it's a yeah. So I think when you said they are brought from the river into these pens? No, they no. completely hatch them and put them in. They just take them and put the so no time. The life cycle is there in that pen? Yes. Or, okay, yes. so they yeah. never. Yeah. It's a bit like a, you know, the chicken industry. Yeah. You know, it's a. But isn't it there? Works and then there's one point of time. You buy them as Yeah. You and then you feed them. Dog. They don't. They don't go to the river. They don't feed in the river. They don't make their big pack and feed in the ocean. And come back. They just kind of put there, and then they grow from us feeding. Like the chicken. That is the chicken. That is the chicken. And so organic salmon is just feed in organic feed. With organic, I mean organic salmon is yeah. Maybe. So the feed is working. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's but not they're still in the same. No, no. I mean, it's a. Mm -hmm. I mean, then you have to have wild salmon. You have to have caught wild salmon. But when you probably see when you buy a piece of salmon, it says it's authentic. It's, it's, I mean, it's that's all generic. No, we normally say aquaculture. Yeah, aquaculture. I know, but I mean, what what kind of fish? Like it says Pacific salmon, usually as a. But like aquaculture then means what? That. Yeah. Okay. To, yeah. Yeah. to breed them in the same way that we also kind of cultivate yeah. sheep. Because I've seen wild caught, not salmon though, no. with other fish. Yeah. But I don't know if you've seen But then wild fish is also a problem. Yes. Each wild fish. Because the the sea is an ocean is not really Yes. Industrial fishing in the sea is like also possible. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, there was an article recently, and I'm reading more of it, but one who said the only thing, I mean, we talk a lot about plastics in the ocean, just stop eating fish. Like, really just stop eating fish. Like, then we might have a chance to save the oceans. But 
it's uh, yeah, and that's what the sort of the industry is doing is just tinkering by taking them out, putting them in, you know, trying to fill up the gaps so that they keep a living, but in a sense they're just making them non, you know, this is this kind of wild and and, and, and cultured that live in antagonism, you know. At the end, like you said, with this shipwrecking in India, it's a necessity for human jobs. Like they can't live there unless they can do something. And if they can't do something with fish, I mean, like this is a longer history of these isles. They've been colonized from the Norwegian Vikings, you know, up to this day. They've also been. They had this huge uh, um, move at the end of the, the 19th century, where they actually, with landowners. Uh, realize that sheep is really lucrative. Before they had kind of plots and people were agriculturalists, you know, small crofters, but it was actually more lucrative to send all the people to Canada to make space for sheep. And then they just sort of filled up Scotland with sheep. And that's why you have like kind of on the west coast of Canada, you have all these sort of Scottish remnants. These were, they were just displaced because sheep needed to be there because lamb was, you know, we had the same with the during the Kelp during the Spanish Revolution, and they started doing kelp, just kelp, because that became a real big market um, globally. And then the Spanish War ended, and then no one needed ammunition, and then it crashed again. And then they always kind of moved in this, um, you know, being made somewhere else, not being made there. You know, they, they were subsistent, they fished and, and took berries, and usually like most places. But, how these changes are so impactful, and I find the contrast when you always think of an island that makes you think that it's so isolated, it makes you be able to think kind of holistically, yeah. <laughs> but it's not that Isn't that very interesting from a historical perspective when you think about the future? Maybe in 50 years people will look back and then they want to protect the salmon mm -hmm. fishing. Yes. The fish farms, because then this has become part of the next Yes, yes. 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 Maybe it's also natural. No, 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 it's not true. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it becomes this concentration. So right now, like, Scotland is giving the ideal um, kind of um, conditions for this type of farm. So it's, it's everywhere. Like, there's just planning applications going in everywhere throughout these islands. When we were there for our island that we lived on, there were two huge plants to kind of build along the coast. It's constant. This constant opportunist, because it's ideal water conditions, People need work, like it's just when it invites itself. Well, but there's still there. I mean, we're talking about this is like very beautiful landscape. That's the only thing they have against it. You know, they still understand like tourist interest. That's the only thing that keeps the single thing at the moment. And they just passed a big law, SIPA, like for Scottish Environmental Protection, that now they've actually made stronger laws on how um, how much chemicals. Are allowed to seep out of these things, but there are no restrictions to the size of these pens, which means the next development that's coming out is kind of offshore, and we're talking gigantic, big facilities, which are also very vulnerable to kind of uh, floods, you know, like big weathers and stuff like that. This is why here they, they like to be protected. They have people that go out all the time and look. I mean, there's some really um, pragmatic and, and like ambitious fish farmers that are wanting to do this good, you know, make, you know, really caring for these salmon, not wanting them to have sea lice infection, like don't wanting to use too much chemicals and all these things. But I mean, the next move is just it just opens up for this possibility. And so, I mean, like the man says, like salmon is a rich man's food, like they should just stick to their sprouts, the species, and laughs. <laughs> it is a understanding of this very. Does anyone work in like an archive of communication in terms of because like it seems that the salmon that is developing there and yeah. the companion species that somebody had to it, so yeah. like it's parasites. parasites but it creates they're not companions. However so. however well it's not exactly <laughs> well but they they definitely live off yeah, they, it's a, for them it's a it's a resource. Yeah. These fish understand their ecology is whatever it is that yes. they're forcing. I guess there are, you know, there's a. I don't know actually if there are. Any of you. this kind of new uh, ecologies? Yeah, I mean, I've seen 
things, but not like anyone doing a bigger. I, I don't know, but it's interesting. That would also be I mean, because you see these mutations. You see, you know, I've seen images where they pull out and you show the same breed and these like slight mutations that has happened. You know, that made this species like unable to behave it, the way it used to behave. Like, it's not just about the looks. It's, it's what you do at the end of the day. And the origins of this parasite. I think it's something that has always lived with salmon or with wild fish, but because of concentration and proximity, they just flourish. It's you know, it's like you know, children in kindergarten and they get mice. Like when they sleep next to each other, they just jump around. You know. <laughs> yeah. No. The, it's actually, I was very impressed when I, when my oldest son was like, he became like a fighter for a fish. Like, he was munching away with the lambs that just like ran around us and was super cute, but he's like, you know. Thank you so much. Merges size and environment. I think more from a historical perspective, maybe more than sort of like scientific, with cultural studies and post-colonial theory. And um, at the very beginning of the conversation, we were actually very inspired when speaking with Carolyn about the program that Simona Miller, who's the head of the department for Virginia, had issue with, uh, yeah, with her small child, so couldn't join us today, has started, which is called uh, Ghost. Exactly. Now, they are all parts of the program. Each one, at the end of the day, has a different type of case studies, which I think really shares a kind of starting point of perspective, but really, I think, delves into very different stories. Um, for example, uh, Ayushi, that one is working actually also on a shipwrecking site in India, in Gorajat. Um, Maximilian Fechter is working actually in Ecuador, in Amazonia, looking particularly also at the effects of the say, Texaco company and the relationship between Texaco and different types of workers' communities, indigenous communities, etc. And Yona Suk instead is working actually, uh, or is looking from a historical to contemporary perspective at the uh, German East and West relationships actually. Mm -hmm. And in this moment in which the 70s and 80s, in which East Germany was actually the biggest receiver of toxic waste in Europe, and hence how 
interestingly toxic ways is what actually bridges the walls in that sense. Mm. Um, now, together, I mean, the idea, in a way, of our sort of dialogue that is manifested through exhibitions of public programs, etc., was really like also trying not to just have a one night stand type of relationship, <laughs> but actually, you know, engage in something that could be larger and could also become a kind of platform also for research and maybe possibly also visionary ideas for the future around how to deal with toxic waste and, and, and toxicity. And via that, we kind of founded, I mean, or started, uh, we decided to name ourselves. I mean, naming maybe is the first act of arts, giving birth, and, uh, which is called Toxic Commons. And I think that the premise of Toxic Commons is really to understand toxicity as a shared ownership, just like everything else. And hence, I guess the, 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 the sort of direction that we're taking is also how by engaging with it productively instead of paranoidly containing it might be a way to um, act upon it essentially. Um, and today, they, I mean, basically they, they they are experimenting themselves, you know, in this I think space of cross pollination between uh, academia and uh, the arts, and hence will actually perform in a way. I think the the core. Questions, doubts, and positions at the at, at the heart, actually, of the discussion around around toxicity. Thank you guys for being here with us. <laughs> thirty years. Can you believe thirty years? So we have just thirty years. What now, Michael? Take a look again. Well, the most recent climate change study from an uh, Australian think tank says that the world as we know it will crumble in, in 2050. So that's it then. We are. Relax. Don't get so excited. I think we still have time. But we have to now, right? So, but there's so many things we can do. Let's talk about them. Yes, and haven't we done? Like, Things have gone wrong and things have been corrected. Um, remember the Basel Convention of 1982? Uh, 1992, once we used to ship hazardous waste to all other parts of the world, and then we realized, oh, this is wrong. So I think there's actually a wave of global solidarity. Like, look at e waste or plastic. Global solidarity. What is that again? Okay, let me spell it out for you. Um, first, that we all live on the same planet. Second, that we live in a toxic world. And thirdly, that only joint action can help us heal. So, did you remember the news we heard a couple of weeks ago that Malaysia and Philippines have returned their toxic plastic waste back to their points of origin in Canada? Or, what do you think about this denim shirt you're wearing? All organic? Don't you remember all the dyes that go into it? Hmm, so, my point here is that waste and toxicity doesn't stay put, so people from Global North export all kinds of toxic hazardous materials, but they just don't stay put there. Yeah, I totally agree. So, even if we wanted to they keep them in one place, contain them, it's not going to work. They keep coming back because we're living in one planet, right? And um, just imagine if we could put all the toxic waste in a um, rocket and just send them to outer space, it wouldn't work. Um, so, let me give you an example, right? The pipelines, the oil pipelines in the Baltic Sea, they really go crisscross underground because they have to avoid toxic waste dumps that are put there since the 1970s, really. Um, everything from like nuclear submarines to chemical weapons and just like toxic waste dumps, they all live down there. And then only in 1972, with the London Dumping Convention, they really banned this practice of ocean dumping. Why? Because all of this stuff, stuff just kept come, coming back. Barrels were surfaced, waste from below, the water washed ashore, fishermen got hurt, swimmers and tourists at the beach could also get hurt. So, what we can learn is that toxicants really don't stay put, they return, they resurface. And this toxic materiality, in fact, really affects us all, and this is why we live kind of on a toxic planet that is full of toxic commons. 
how's it gone? So, do you mean something like um, plastic waste in the oceans? Yes. I mean, that's a toxic waste. The fish that eat plastic are getting eaten by us, and then we can say, but then, I mean, that would be exactly the same with like, pesticides in our food or chemicals affecting our body hormones. Yeah, it's exactly what I want to say. I mean, just consider. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the point is that um, the question is we. No, in the end, I think it's, it's nice to say it's all comments and so on. But many of these comments actually pollute by private companies. Um, and this is happening in places that can't really defend themselves. Most toxic waste dumps are actually situated in poor neighborhoods. In the, in the US, for example, most often in where um, people of color live. So, if we think about air as comments, um, we see that all the CO2 that we're pumping out there um, will surely affect all of us, but it's just distributed in an unequal and unjust way. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, but maybe it helps us. Um, to, to think about toxic commons um, as a like, natural phenomenon that you know uh, affects different people in different times differently, but as a concept. In what way? Like, so if we understand toxic commons as a natural phenomenon uh, with toxicity all around us, rather than focusing on a concept, it really takes us to take responsibility. It really like asks us like, how, what can we do? Like, how can we? Do that, and then it's a simple two way logic, right? First of all, we realize that we live in this toxic world, as we've discussed today already. Um, and second of all, like, how can that responsibility look like? And yeah, like taking responsibility. That, that also means like valuing those feelings of helplessness that we have when we hear these global problems. I mean, I don't feel passive anymore when I, I think I can, I can do something, I can bring a change. Yeah, because I think. You are being contaminated through your research, right? Really directly, and then that makes you a stakeholder in this whole story, right? And I think that's really opposite from being passive. And commons has a really long history uh, as a concept as well, not only as a concept but of action, right? Of commoning. And I think we should really all join this like process. Come on. Why? I mean, okay. Let me really spell it out. Um, first of all. Spreading the idea of toxic commons has the potential to lead to solidarity as we realize that we're all sitting in the same boat. We just can't get rid of dangerous material effects of our lifestyles. But as I told you before, it's very obvious that some are more affected than others. And communities located near waste dumps don't cause them pollution, it's others, be it through consumerism or warfare. Yeah, of course, right? The idea of the toxic commons isn't understating the fact that there's environmental injustice, right? Um, by you know, institutionalized by capitalist and socialist systems. But climate change is probably the best example, the climate crisis is actually the best example, how it affects us all, and we will all suffer from these kind of uh, consequences. Uh, and I think we have to act jointly. Otherwise, we don't solve the problem. But, no, I don't buy that point because the failing climate change negotiations are actually the best example for the lack of solidarity, especially from industrial societies. And the way that one you end meeting after the other for decades and nothing really changed. And like, no one's taking one of the responsibility. But that's exactly my point. I mean, many governments of the global north still think that their immune to these detrimental effects of many toxic problems we inhabit. I mean, once we realize that we are all being affected, we might finally start to produce some changes this planet desperately needs. Yeah, in this ironic way, this might be the best solution, right? I mean, when you realize that the, the dye in the shirt is actually chemically polluted, you will act because you're affected. And it's not only the marginalized groups in society, but these big companies, they themselves get polluted. I think that's a bit naive because you underestimate the actual power and, and self interest of these multinational corporations. I mean, just have a look at, at the polluted rainforest snack or uh, study. Um, we have this, this huge, um, yes, American oil company, Texaco, um, that now belongs to Chevron. 
And they have been producing oil in this super tiny Latin American country in the 70s and 80s. And when they left, they left a huge mess. Like polluted rivers, the air is contaminated, and like so many cases of cancer. And since then, thousands of indigenous people and settlers have fought the company in the courts. And I've been there last year when these settlers, these people, this organization won at the Constitutional Court in Quito. And Turban was condemned to pay $9 billion to remediate the cultural and ecological damages. $9 billion. But what's happening? Nothing. Because Turban just says, well, we don't pay, we don't care. This is all fraud. And there's, there's no government, there's no nation, there's, in fact, especially not the UN, that can make them pay in the end. And, um, yeah, you guys really think it's like now the time like the local, local people or the international community to do it? Well, but at least in this case, these indigenous communities all get got together, they fought for their rights against these powerful American lawyers. Can we please not romanticize these communities again? Uh, are we really bestowing that much power on collective action? I mean, after all, Aristotle said, what is common to the greatest number has the least care bestowed upon it. Everyone thinks chiefly of, of his own, partly at all of the common interest. And this is something we see in the world today, like international power politics. The majority of people and nations are still believing in the development program. They want to grow and care very little about how they feel, especially non-humans. So Western industrial nations have been looting the world for like the last two, three hundred years. So why shouldn't the up and coming countries continue to do so? What about the right to pollute? So I mean, look at China, for example, with their mining companies, companies, they just export their dirt industries to Southeast Asian or African countries. Yes. <laughs> I hope you realize that you sound like a white Western intellectual if you quote Aristotle all the time. <laughs> well, it's exactly my point. <laughs> I thought Aristotle. Oh, oh no, no, no. Let's keep Aristotle away for a second. What I'm talking about is a fundamental shift. Then you realize it. That we are in this humanity mess together. We need to stop thinking in binaries. Um, these binaries of inside and outside, of externalization, re internalization, global north, global south. I mean, this is just a capitalist rhetoric, which will really not get us anywhere. We keep on creating an in and out group of people and keep on believing that there's space somewhere outside of our own system where we can dump things and it will not affect us. But clearly that's not the case. And so we need to start acknowledging and we need to shift to a language that does that. Hence, commons. But I think it's super unfair because we're not common in our toxic experiences. I mean, look at the daily life of, of a waste picker in an e-waste waste dump in Ghana, for example. Their life is very different from my daily office life. They, like, in their daily work, they, they burn uh, cables to get to the copper, to the metals. And they have to inhale all these fumes every day. But these cables are coming from my old computer. And, I mean, we acknowledge it. Waste goes where there's least resistance, and also where probably poor communities are in need of jobs. Yeah, but this difference in toxicity exposure, then it shouldn't lead us to think like Lawrence Summers back in the 90s. Lawrence. Well, Lawrence Summer was the chief economist um, of the World Bank in the 1990s. And like a little note leaked from him where he stated that uh, poor countries in Africa are underpolluted and overpopulated. So, toxic commons doesn't mean that we are all equal. I mean, think this is, this is community, right? But uh, we're all human beings, and if we don't want the waste here because we think it's making us sick and destroying our ecosystem, we should not presume that poor and underpolluted African societies might want it. In fact, if you ask them if they wanted to make money from important waste um, or the trade that is safe to their environment and their health, I think they would certainly prefer the better. I mean, we all just want to live in dignity, right? I, I so agree with you, Lars. I mean, we need to take care of our own waste here and not somewhere else. It shouldn't like be our system. Only this way we figure out a better way of changing our production methods because we have to face our own detriments. Yeah, but it's like the burden relative to where you're from. Look, look at like a person from rural Germany, people that have done journal studies, studies. 
they live near wastelands, and they might be really frustrated, frustrated with, the, with this position relative to the capital city, the Berlin, where most of this waste is actually produced. They live in the countryside and they have to deal with it. Um, and compared to other parts of the world, of course, they have a super privileged life, but they feel treated unjustly. And one of the outcomes comes my be political frustration and it's the support of experts. Yeah. And in 2019, the far right party of the strongest party in that region. I mean, I don't know if it's only because of waste but it's part of the reason. Yeah, that no exists. Um, but then, if we actually look at other parts of the world, we see that the spread of toxicity is nothing else as another form of colonial violence. I mean, first, ages ago, the nations in the global north appropriated all the resources of the colonies and poison the values of the people as much or not put it. And now the export of toxic waste and the emission of greenhouse gases literally poisons these environments. So it's a nice idea to actually and finally close industrial systems, but it seems a bit hypocritical to suggest that with that idea of the concept of the toxic commons, we all happily share the burden of what has been contaminated in the past. Yeah but it's not easy, right? It's not an easy concept. And the pure lifestyle is really ingrained in us, certainly in my home country. Um, so we have to ask ourselves if we can really unthink our privileges, and I think we have had this discussion uh, today already. And Toxic Commons is kind of the first step to try and do that, and form a new relationship with our community within the nation, but also within the entire globe. Yeah, yeah totally, I agree with this. As I said, I mean, toxic commons is the ability and is a shift in conscience, rhetoric, systems, and in how we root ourselves in the here and now of this planet and how we talk about it. It should be a new language that goes beyond what economic people like Lauren Summers use, like the language of externalization, negative value. What I'm trying to say is that we have to understand that there are toxic commons. We also have to create a language that we are common and have a shared responsibility to deal with it, as we all have a toxic common exposure to it. Yeah, I think toxic commons can really stimulate action and create new forms of communication and collaboration between artists and researchers. And I think today has been a really good example of how that could actually work, right? Um, this show is about toxicity, it's in a toxic space. And we all share this like toxic responsibility. So you say like the point of today is that we go home all a little bit more contaminated. No. The point here is that the point is about coexistence. So coexistence with toxicity. But we also get infected with new ideas for a better toxic tomorrow, maybe? <laughs> well, I'm not yet convinced, but I would really like to know what our audience thinks. <laughs> 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 yes, and that's the end, and I, I think we want to talk about more like toxic commons. I think we've heard in Caroline's talk already about a different example about the toxic common, you know, this like space shared between four islands. How can we think about toxic commons in that sense? Yeah. Could you think of Toxic Commons as, um, as a huge redistribution project um, where um, you would map out the locations of, of toxic waste and then um, see the percentage of um, toxic waste in other places and then basically say, okay, even on a local level, like in this part of town, there's like this amount of toxic waste, in that part of town, there's none. So, so maybe we put like um, 50 percent of the toxic waste to that part of town because that might um, create a different pressure on people because then they are directly confronted. I mean, in climate, in the climate discussion, there's the, 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 this expression of climate justice, and uh, and maybe toxic justice would be like uh, another word for the toxic toxic comments. But I, I wonder, like, if this is something that could make sense, you know, to, to bring it to the doorstep of those who feel that they are... Mm -hmm. Actually, like, in legal terms, it's like the primitive principle. 
the one who pollutes us to, to, to deal with it. Because that shouldn't leave the system, because then once it leaves um, the system, we are not willing to invest so much in new technologies to actually deal with it. Mm -hmm. It's just a Yeah, but we, as you also, also mentioned, we, we we're dealing with a, with a process that already has produced a history. So there's like some countries have already produced so much more toxicity than others in the past. Um, well, yeah, it's really interesting because this speaks directly to the return to sender campaigns of Greenpeace mm -hmm. that they did in the 90s. Mm -hmm. um, for example, when they brought toxic waste shipments back from Romania to Germany and then confronted the, the German environmental minister um, with the task to like, deal with it in a proper way than just sending it off. And then they had to like, burn it properly, like, burn it properly. It's still hazardous, but at least it's happening then in Germany. It's, it's a question of cost in the end, because they could have done this at the very beginning. Yeah. Why they should it? Because it's so much cheaper. And it, it can also backlash. So, uh, in the 1980s, there's this example, an ironic example, of how Italy um, ships barrels and barrels of waste to Ghana. And uh, the Ghanaian government says, no, we are not taking it. But um, the waste traders, the Italian waste traders, force the farmers to take the waste. So the waste comes to uh, Ghana, and it's realized, um, no, that no, 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 we are not going to take it. So, and then uh, Ghana just ships back the waste to Italy, saying, it's your waste, we are not taking it. And the Italian government sues Ghana for returning their waste back to them. So this redistribution really doesn't work all the time. Some campaigns work, some don't. Uh, but I think we had these elaborate discussions yesterday night about is this redistribution a way of dealing with it? Um, and we're still like... Yeah, yeah this is I think one question that we're having in the internal discussions is whether redistribution also dilutes the harm mm -hmm. or not. Mm -hmm. And of course, in reality, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. I mean, very important, and that's also what came into your presentation, is really a matter of scale and concentration. But sometimes it's not, like with us vessels. I mean, it's not just about concentration. It's like one inhale could already produce harm. So distributing means harming more people mm -hmm. also. So it becomes us a question of like... That. Yeah, like, you know, there is a certain violence that is inherent in redistribution when it just causes the same harm. Uh, but it's a, it's, a, it's a complicated terrain. Mm -hmm. But like so far, it's been actually the most... Uh, Effective. Tool, most effective tool. Uh, these tools in the 1990s, um, Greenpeace at the time, they really got a fundraised lot of money and then they pushed towards the Basel Convention, which is actually banning all shipments of hazardous waste um, across nations. If the standard of the disposal is lower than in the country where the actual waste is coming from. Mm -hmm. And you can, there are so many loopholes in the Basel Convention with like recycling and stuff, but um, it's a really good first step, right? And like you can see that these kind of actions that put pressure on the stakeholders in the same country, so you're totally right. And this is like a double morale, the morale of modern environmentalism from the 70s who protested against having more incineration in their own country. And those like protests, those green protests, then led to the first shipments abroad from Germany to Turkey. Um, that was the very first um, return to center campaign. Yeah. You think, when have you been last time? Or when did you use the last time in terms of comment? Youth. It's not exposed. 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 Yeah. I don't know. A saint here is claiming I shouldn't be drinking the tap water here. <laughs> I do tap water all the time. I know. I did too, but we were having a discussion after her doing a bit of researching about soil contamination mm. in Belgium. She does not drink the water. In general? Because I went in, I came to the hotel yesterday and then I Google, I always Google, can I drink the tap water? Huh. I said it's fine. But then after you know, talking to her, she would only do it if you filter it. She can't do that. Why do you drink bottled water? Right? No, it's okay. I mean, that's the same, it's the same yeah, thing. So, like, if you go, it's the same, you know, it gets hotter and hotter and hotter when we just turn off the air conditioning. I mean, and I think it's the personalization of this concept. Yeah. Like, whatever you do, like water as a body of commons mm -hmm. is very hard to go around to, mm -hmm. have, to have pure water, right? Mm -hmm. You have to run to the source yes. and then you might find like pure water. Mm -hmm. Where else do we find pure water nowadays? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
but there's something in, in this. There was an interesting comment about research from elimination and about elimination as kind of as a strategy, which relates then to this idea of redistribution of complexity. And in the process, you mentioned this uh, this intertwining between artists and academic research, but that's also that's the only people that will be willing to campaign for this because, like, what you're proposing is politically fundamentally unfeasible. There's no political party or government that will voluntarily at any time even touch upon the idea of. Uh, of taking back in uh, any form of toxicity if it's not if it's not massively reworked uh, in something that can be presented to its population or constituencies as valuable or beneficiary uh, because this or that material reworked can become a great piece of a highway or something along those lines. And also here amongst in the, in the room I'm absolutely convinced that based on our financial capacities we will always avoid a place that we know tries to condense or, or centralize uh, toxicity. Like, this is something that works, that works on, the, in, 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 on the imaginative realm, or as something to force upon people as a campaign strategy, as a radical intervention, but will never work on the, on the, on the, on the political scale. But it works like that way. I mean, when China and now Malaysia and the Philippines just say, no, I mean, it's not, then it's just stuck. I mean, yeah, yeah, but that's but that's how it works. Yeah. Saying no because yeah. your because your populations are moved to a certain status or yeah. quality of living and yeah. say no more. Yeah. Or our government says no more, or at least we don't have to take this in anymore to ensure basic quality of living. But I also wonder, I mean, maybe that's something also you were saying, but there's also maybe a linguistic problem or like how can one shift the language because also when you talk about the song for instance you know we talk about loss loss of privilege making a sacrifice and i wonder it's also about turning things around by thinking this is not a loss or a sacrifice this is actually an enrichment for an ecosystem that will live better like and i feel all of these discussions are always all about losing sacrifice pain ta -da -da, almost as if you know, like it's almost like the subject needs to be completely reverted, which actually is very true also to my, the, my, the migration discussion. It's always all about uh, we will have less space, we will, we will lose this, we have to make the sacrifice of cohabitation instead of. And if you think about also on the legal level, how fundamental language is, because one of the things also of the, of the you know, Basel Convention is that it is circumnavigated by, instead of talking about toxic waste, talking about recycling. Like that. Damn simple in a sense, it has been to turn and like actually continue the same type of trades just by naming them differently and hence, in that naming, also giving them a different legal status. And the same thing that has happened for the climate crisis right now, like climate yeah. change and the climate crisis, yeah. happened already in the 90s by doing these like changing words, like yeah. changing, yeah. changing the language, yeah. using for example toxic waste, yeah. colonialism, yeah. using not Sondermüll, like special waste, as it's legally named, but uh, toxic ones. Yeah. Like changing names doing mm -hmm. interventions in those ways is a radical change. Yeah. And I think yeah. Is, you to say something? Yeah, I mean um, the thing is I mean with my research what what uh, was very interesting I lately found was that maybe redistribution of waste politically might not work. Uh, I'm sure uh, it wouldn't. But the whole idea that um, ships from all over the world now are coming to India, they get broken. Um, steel is produced, it's uh, not virgin steel, it's reloadable steel. And that steel, again, is exported. Um, and what, what was found was that uh, in the 2000s, early 2000s, some of the steel was exported. It came to Germany and that steel was used uh, in building lifts uh, by the company Otis. And then the company realized that the steel is radioactively contaminated because the ships have radioactive waste in it too. So, and then they just ban those exports, saying that we won't take the steel. No, this is this is not good enough for construction. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the idea with the research is to show that it's not just waste that is sent from the open to the but also does come back in various forms, and the realization has to come uh, in which, mm -hmm. right? And, then, yeah. right? and by understanding that more broader and tangible yeah. than that might lead to political action, because nobody's in you. So this waste is coming back. No, no, yeah, of course, of course. But I think it's also interesting. It's interesting. I, I completely agree with your project of massive 
um, redistribution project around around public <coughs> funds. I think it's the right thing to do. I just know that no one of us who is going to do, is going to engage in voluntary, so it has to be enforced. And yeah. enforcement in that sense will never come from an existing from existing political class in the short term benefit space in which they operate. Mm -hmm. So it's also it's an interesting given that when you speak about contamination in terms of interdisciplinarity, that, that kind of campaign will have to come from another kind of coalition. And that potentially artists and researchers could be such a coalition is very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I think um, the fact that, for example, Germany is, is, at the moment attracts waste to be burned because we've built up so much good, expensive technology to burn waste properly mm -hmm. that uh, countries like Italy send us waste. Yeah, to burn. Yeah, that's so, really important. Yeah. It's also happening the other way. I mean, Germany is sending radioactive waste to France, which has a very advanced technology in like, dealing with very high level mm -hmm. radioactive waste. So, yeah, yeah, the nuclear um, uh, waste is like, something completely different and we're not dealing with that in our group. Yeah. But it goes to show that if they have, like, some people have good knowledge about how to handle that waste, then it's fine to ship it. Like, uh, we probably don't have anything against like, the mobility of waste per se, but just like the knowledge about how to handle it. And I think then, um, in a way, we're importing already um, our, like, some more waste because we have the knowledge now to handle it. And in that way, it's also a business for these factories to keep on burning that stuff. And, and so then, then it becomes a commodity, not with a negative um, value, but with a positive value. And in that sense, that's an opportunity to have this at return to science as well. Maybe a detail, but um, I'm just curious, do you know whether uh, the, the residue that stays or that remains from the burning process, is that then shipped back to the country that, um, that sent the waste, or is it, does it all stay in Germany? Yeah, it mostly stays in Germany. There's one yeah, big place in half an hour order. That's the biggest underground uh, uh, landfill, the yeah, storage yeah. facility in the world. Because that must be hyper toxic. Yeah. yeah. They have a toxic library. They, um, they fill up the glass like that um, with all the substances they um, bring in. Yeah. And then they put it in an old salt mine and then they put it underground and they put um, walls, they like construct walls to close it off. But then still sometimes it catches fire as well. Um, yeah. it's, it's fascinating because it's kind of the same way in the exhibition. With this um, radioactive waste final storage of Finland, it's the very same mm -hmm. thing. I mean, of course, we think now this is good there, yeah. uh, but it also might come back. Yeah, in Finland, but then it's like in uh, yeah. super north. I don't know which country it's in. Because Germany it seems that at the moment this seems to be like the, um, the solution that. Uh, um, my, my father is, uh, is, is a doctor and, uh, and he works in, in the diabetes uh, field and they were um, invited by the environmental ministry um, to, to um, you know, for a conversation about um, disposal of insulin and, uh, and other you know, medical uh, materials. And, and, uh, and the environmental minister, ministry um, advises that all medical um, materials should be put in the normal ways and that uh, doctors should, should tell patients to do that um, because it's the only safe way to dispose of, um, of medical materials like um, uh, syringes. Hmm? Yeah, like. Um, you know, from, from aspirin to... Um, so the chemicals, like the pharmaceutical chemicals, not the plastics. All pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical products <coughs> should be put into the, the domestic <coughs> waste because then they will be burned in this high-tech way. And that's the only way, it cannot, it would, in their you know, narrative, it, that it doesn't enter the groundwater or the water science. Yeah. 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 Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And that seems to be now their kind of formula. Um, that, you know, this is, this is the safe way. Yeah. Um, so we have to carry on. This is the same way. Yeah, because people are ready, but they have that in Yeah, okay. I don't know if to, we have to adapt the space. Okay. Do we? Oh. Thank you so much, guys.
Anything? No. So just downstairs and we just say no. So, uh, thank you all for being here. As you know, this is the closing chapter of the exhibition at the affairs that is running since three months, more or less. So it was quite nice. I mean, what you missed before was actually having the main researchers that have contributed to the knowledge that has been put together for the exhibition, um, actually giving talks and, and discussing some of the aspects um, that I think also are maybe questions and conflicting positions that are actually at the core of the, of the whole exhibition perhaps, but also I think at the core of all these discussions around what to do about climate crisis or climate opportunities. Um, I'm very happy to have Natasha and Ashton finally <laughs> with us. Um, they're actually here out of a collaboration that we have also with Contour Biennale and Sally Contemporary in Berlin. They've been commissioned a new work that will premiere at Contour in October, yes. And that will, will also be showing actually in Berlin, most, almost at the same time. Um, and the, the, the piece actually relates very much to a work and an investigation that I've been bringing forward for quite a few years, and I think their practice in general is also quite characterized by a very, very kind of slow and long-term approach to research. So I feel that this idea of decelerating is already part of their artistic practice, and that's something that I think is also inherent in some of the points being brought forward in the, in the exhibition. Um, I won't tell you too much. I mean, it is part of something that's called carbon theater, and had different iteration in, in different cities, and what we're going to look at tonight um, is looking back at some of the sonic investigations of the past, and I guess also what they tell us about what will come next. Thank you both for 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 the piece. Um, let's give them a <laughs> Um, that was not used anymore to, to for protections. 
but we use it to project um, a multi-channel sound installation into it. And as you can imagine, it's not you can't really reproduce that, you know, in this setting. So we we thought we do kind of um, a listening session uh, combining different materials from both acts. Um, and yeah, is there anything that I should? No, actually, no okay, then we can just start. Okay. So we're going to be moving between reading things out loud, listening to things, um, and I'm going to start with uh, an, an excerpt. I've also edited some of the material. I'm going to start with an excerpt from um, a booklet that we actually produced for Act 2 of the project in Sharjah. Uh, and it's a kind of intro into our process and the questions that are kind of underlying the part of your investigation. We've been studying together for some time now. It's not what you might think. Study is something else other than school. It's what's before and after, what's in between. It's a pity, actually, that we have such bad science teachers when we were in school. This was one of the first thoughts we had a few summers ago when we began to study chemistry. One of the things we studied is bonds. How things come together, relate, and eventually fall apart. Studying bonds is about thinking the world and its wonders as one of changing alliances, where the story of how carbon and hydrogen meet and the potent formation they make is also the story of how alchemists want to transform and purify the soul. It is a story of how the forms of the human world are reflected and refracted in the forms of the more than human world. We listen to many voices, some human, some not. One voice told us about a human invention, the open pit coal mine. Hadzio pictured it. It's a wound. It's obscene. How did he know? He had felt it for himself as part of the ongoing Ende Gelenda campaign, an alliance of individuals and organizations who engage in mass civil disobedience actions at various coal mining sites in Germany. In one operation, they were able to shut down a late night mine in Lusatia. Elizabeth reminded us that when we question formations of power, we immediately encounter nothing short of drama. A drama that organizes what we hold dear and where we think the plot is going, she said. Protagonists versus antagonists, a logic of confrontation, action, catharsis, and resolution that seeps into an entire civilization's imagination of happening. Take petroleum, a form seemingly not alive whose energetic potential has driven a certain mode of human life to understand itself through steady flow and liquidity. In this process, this same mode of life has initiated transformations that are now extinguishing other forms of existence on a planetary scale, itself included. The dramatic plot speaks. The Earth is dying. Humanity is engineering its own demise. The ecologists plead, save the earth and thereby save humanity. The capitalists strategize, save some humans and make sure where they live is livable, or make sure where they are is livable. It becomes apparent that only human perspectives speak in this narrative, or rather only the perspectives of certain humans. And yet, Carbon's transformations in and out of existing forms refuses to abide by its imaginary positioning within this anthropocentric theater. From ancient plant to geological deposit, subterrestrial fossil to liquid capital, pipeline stream to geopolitical agent, carbon spaces and times echo on, echo on the margins of where we think the scene is taking place requiring a sensitizing apparatus for attuning to its resonance. So now we will play a section from Carbon Theater Act 1. The sonic bill we call it is uh, uh, a section towards the end um, with Elizabeth Pogonelli um, in conversation with us over Skype. 
describes true quality, but it'd be a bit hard to hear. <laughs> Tactics and figures that destabilize 
the distinction between life and non-life. It stands for all things perceived and conceived as denuded of life, and by implication, all things that could, with the correct deployment of technological expertise or proper stewardship, be remade hospitable to life. We must de-dramatize human life as we squarely take responsibility for what we are doing. This simultaneous de-dramatization and responsabilization may allow for opening new questions rather than life and non-life, we will ask what formations we are keeping in existence or extinguishing. Should I say um, some of the 
light yes. from the, yeah. the second act. Yeah. Uh, so this is the yellow light in the sky where we took a different approach um, because, as I mentioned, we had a planetarium as a space and we thought that um, instead of having something very close with you on, on the headphones to, to really um, project the sounds into this empty sky, you know, basically where, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of a dark sky and it's mm -hmm. kind of fitting. So um, what what we can only play here is, is yeah, a kind of a stereo version of it and also the speakers are not necessarily able to to really play the, the full scope of these sounds that are in some, um, or in most cases, extremely rich in, in, in frequencies. So you have like uh, some, sometimes like really saturated over the entire frequency spectrum from very kind of like heavy bass to like um, high frequency sounds. Um, so you will miss quite a bit of the kind of physical um, way in which the sound you know, really like <coughs> what it does to your body. But we, we wanted to, to have a situation in the planetarium where you are really physically absorbed by these different types of sites of energy production. Some of them fossil fuel or gas and some of them renewable. Do you think we should mention that? No, I, I, we were discussing this, but I personally think we should maybe first share the sounds with you. If we selected three sites that we want to share today. Yeah. And then afterwards we can tell you what the sites are. I yeah. personally think it's nicer to kind of go into these spaces without having something that your imagination can kind of invoke, but just to see where it takes you. Um, yeah. So yeah, but we'll tell you what they are after we <laughs> or where they are.
Um, the first track that we played, uh, do you think you really want to see about the composition of the recordings? Because of the um, I can't, I don't know if you want to No, um, So the first track that we heard is uh, from the Shushan Historical Hydraulic System, which is a set of ancient, um, it's basically an ancient water mill um, from the third century. Iran, which is uh, bordering Iraq. It's a uh, uh, marshland. It's, very, it, it's also this, Khuzestan is the main site of the natural gas extraction. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very close to, to um, where the project of Nida, uh, mm -hmm. Nida site was an exhibition relates to it's, it's the same province. And it's, it's uh, quite, yeah, it's quite close to that. Mm -hmm. Um, also, because the river is Karun River, that the, these, this ancient site of four, it's basically forty-six um, wheels kind of elevated across a kind of dam, but it's not really a dam because the doors open and close. Um, you can open and close these using um, uh, to allow water to kind of turn these these wheels that then produces energy, but it also is used for milling and grounding flour and seed into uh, grains and seeds into flour and oil. And they're still functioning. And it's still functioning. When you heard the pumping sound, that's the mills. But did you edit the sounds yeah. together? Yeah. Or is yeah, it yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah. that's why I also so what, what, what we did What we did was we recorded the site um, from different locations. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, like if, if you have a large site, which most of the energy production are like large sites, so kind of in a sort of mapping, you know, to, to place the microphones on this side and then to place it on that side, and then in a four channel um, situation, like play, like, you know, that recording, that recording together, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then when we were moving through spaces, like if they're like really large, we would try to capture different parts of, of the site. Mm -hmm. um, so in the last one, which is the liquid petroleum facility in Trajan, it's, it, there's, there's, it's a, like a really vast site. So like different um, stages of turning yeah. gas into liquid right. yeah. petroleum of different kinds. Uh, for for transporting it in ships, mm -hmm. and you have to make it liquid because otherwise it's, it explodes on the ship. Um, and it, there's like huge compressors that, um, that also with um, cooling systems. Yeah. They're basically giant refrigerators. Yeah. <laughs> Bringing down the temperature of the gas to a point where it becomes liquid. Yes, yeah, so that was the last one that we heard. The Charge of National Oil Corporation snock the uh, liquid petroleum gas um, terminal, uh, which is right outside of Sharjah in this free trade zone. And then the second one that we heard is from the Fujera oil pipeline. Um, it's section. Yeah. It's sections of a pipeline infrastructure that basically starts in the Gulf of Oman, outside of the Straits of Hormuz, and is being built through uh, the Emirates right now with, of course, uh, plans to connect it to pipelines in Saudi Arabia and through Iraq and Syria to basically avoid the possibility that if Iraq were to close the Straits of Hormuz, to avoid the possibility of uh, oil uh, exports being blockaded. And, and there it's basically um, because the pipeline itself is underground and you can't hear it. So we, we just um, went along the pipeline and recorded in different locations um, until it reached, reaches the harbor. Um, uh, or it's, it's, at the moment it's, it's kind of end point. So like, that's why you hear different locations and they are outside. Uh, and they have like different types of production, but it's basically where the pipeline is underneath. And it was, it's for the most part following the electricity grid because there are moments where it appears close to. Yeah, there's also uh, moments where it comes over ground yeah. or where there's like um, uh, it's, 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 
Yeah. But um, or also bridges, for example, um, where where you, you can see it, but in most parts it's um, it's underground. It also goes through the mountains. From the yeah, so I was thinking now to share with you three, uh, three short little excerpts also from the little booklet for Act Two, and they're more along the kind of poetic register. I mean, one is actually a, a poem um, that I wrote uh, basically from notes of the conversation that we were having coming back from Iran and pursuing the, the site visits and the recordings of Kuzestan. And there's a an image that you used to promote the event, uh, which is a photograph that you took um, as we were driving from basically along the highway from Atmos and Abadan, which are two uh, very important cities in the history of Iran's uh, oil and gas manufacturing. As we were driving to Shushtan, which is in the same province but a bit higher up in the land, um, the sun was setting and there was a also a flame from guess, one of the, the processing plants um, also burning in the sky and the sun and the flame were basically right next to each other. Um, and it kind of created this very strange topsy-turvy feeling of where where am I standing? Where is up and down? And, um, where and also these two, basically these two signs in the sky. Yeah. <laughs> I mean the, the oil, like, you know, it's kind of like a full cycle of, of, of the old sun. And uh, some black sun. Yeah, and there was this this yellow line, mm -hmm. like basically the fumes collected in the sky. Like you often have that when, when you go to places where there's refineries or where there's um, sites of, of also of extraction where they they burn um, the, the gases that they feel are like um, you know don't make enough profit, so they they burn them also in fracking sites. So you have this like layer on the sky um, of yeah, the fumes basically. So I'm going to read you this poem, and then there's two little more kind of reflection texts, but they're all in reference to this trip to Kuzestan. And another important thing to keep in mind is uh, the geography. I mean, Iran is for the most part a plateau, right? The mountain is surrounded by kind of mountains on all sides, and Kuzestan is this drainage basin mm -hmm. where you have. The snows from the mountains are melting into rivers that come down into this like lowland marshland. Mm -hmm. So it's a very rich land. It's very lush and green and tropical, and, and it's always been very arable in this part of the fertile crescent. Um, and so there's also ancient sites there, including uh, ancient ziggurats and ruins that um, will also be referred to in this text. Anyway, just as a kind of contextualization. How are we doing? A yellow line cutting horizontally across the dome, the same in reverse, a blurry line, a region of experience where carbon moves, set against the sun. A single point, a burning flame, not eternal, a blaze in the sky. It burns, next to it the sun sets. Big fire, little fire, a point, a circle, a line of smoke rises up, spreading out, thinning out, yellowing out. A second horizon, Intersecting the horizon. The sky is closing, she said. Alienated production makes the smog. Revolution makes the sunshine. Yves de Boer wrote this in 1971 in a pamphlet entitled A Sick Planet. That fateful year may be posited as the start of a world picture to which we are spectators well into the present day. The peak of petroleum production worldwide, 
the routine regulation of the US dollar, the shift to an unofficial black gold standard, the theory of unlimited growth, crises, wars, embargoes, and revolutions. The smog has spread. The curse of the weather gods was inscribed into the clay ziggurat thousands of years ago. May he who breaks a single stone have his race removed from the earth. Stones upon stones shattered and broken, will a we disappear? Or will this we regroup and reform, no longer self-evident, as ash, bone, coral, indigo, salt, sand, or sugar? Looking out onto the marshy fields of Puzestan, an ancient land holding silent ruins, a modern landscape of technocratic melancholy, the collapse of single-point perspective as we gazed out of the car window towards the fiery horizon not only swept us off our feet in space, it opened our senses up to time. Forward and backward, up and down, a sphere whose edges are never witnessed, a succession of circular positions from small to large. An atom of carbon bonding with another element, bacterial DNA encased within a cell membrane, a species gazing at the sky, a planet rotating around a star, a solar system inside a cloud of cosmic dust, bundles of galactic light moving outwards in never ending space, a time movement propelled by a sonic bang, an ongoing echo of an unknown technicity. Water within water, light within light, is it possible to distinguish a particle within a wave? This is a sensation, this is a sensitization towards a scale deeper than you, other than you, not necessarily bigger or smaller than you, but surrounding you. Or rather, you enter the surround. There is turbulence. So I, I, I guess we, we would leave you with a last sound file. Um, and I will just tell you what it is. Um, it's, it's recorded in the Lausitz in Jenschwalde, which is one of the really vast open pit mines of Lignite Co. Um, Lignite Co being like the, the type of coal that um, yeah, produces the least amount of energy uh, and, and creating brown coal. Brown coal. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it's it's lignite coal. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and there's um, there's huge um, <coughs> this huge open pit mine in the Lausitz, so, so far from, from Berlin. There's one uh, close to Bonn. Um, the German government decided, um, I guess, mostly for political reasons. To, um, to not divest from, um, from ground coal, even though it's um, environmentally a um, complete disaster. Um, what has been mentioned before, um, the way that the right wing um, successfully manages to, um, to mobilize um, the, the workers um, and that threat that if you close the the minds and you know the people will vote for AfD. This this kind of um, problem has also um, been uh, an issue with um, climate justice activists. Anyway, this is a, a mix of like um, just listening to the site and then um, a recording of um, an independent action at the uh, at the Lausitz. Um, open
Um, and so these climate activists uh, from any Gelände, um, was you could hear in one um, in one chant, they were saying um, um, that all machines are standing still if the blue finger um, decides, and um, that. There are different groups call themselves fingers. Mm -hmm. So there were like groups of, of hundreds of people who would go in from different sides so that the police cannot stop all of them at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so one of the fingers would be able to reach um, the diggers. Mm -hmm. So once you know you reach the diggers and you go where you're not supposed to go, they have to stop. Mm -hmm. So they were able to stop the diggers um, already several times. Mm -hmm. um, and that's I, I mean that's a huge damage for um, and it's it's quite as I mean it's also um, I think it's also just um, a, a moment that gives you energy you know when you when you're able to to stop such a machine um, the effects are you know um, maybe less felt you know of the few hours that you are able to stop it but oh, this one was this, the, the recordings are from the late June um, and that was stopped for 48 hours. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a significant amount of time. Yeah, absolutely. But, um, yeah, leaving you with that as um, a call to action. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>
we briefly chatted last night. Um, part of the interest in working with sound, mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, you also have to imagine the, 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 the installation in charge of this in this planetarium for channels. There is it actually goes into your body. You know, it's really the resonance and how it hits you. Yeah, and, and that's something also that I like. You know, there's a discussion of how do you sensitize yourself? How do you how do you grasp mm -hmm. kind of the scale or the urgency of these issues? Mm -hmm. And you know, you can be fed with tons of information. You can be shown all these images. What actually is it going to hit you? Um, and in a way, sound kind of takes you to a place that is it's not so much about understanding, but really about kind of feeling, feeling it or attuning yourself to the. To, also, sounds that are always there. That's what's so interesting yeah. to think of the, the, the kind of. They produce, like around the clock. Yeah. At least they're there. You know, they're, they're echoes and traces of somehow in the background noise, if you want to. Think now, I thought about this very much because where we're living out on this island, you have silence. Like, you literally have silence. And then the small steps towards noise become very, very violent because it's super contaminating. Like really. And it's associated, I found it so fascinating with the first sound piece that I just have like images of old speed trains. Like that, it's, it's funny where it lets you go. It's because uh, images, I think, we sort better. We learn to sort images. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, that's what we decided also not to show it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just the sight of course, yeah. visually, they're very impressive. Yeah. 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 That the image takes over. Yeah. 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 And that's just the visual, and it becomes very kind of traditional. We did recordings in, uh, in the Lausitz the next day. Um, there was a film shoot there um, where they um, where they shot scenes of World War One. Because it's just the perfect environment. Mm -hmm. Um, you don't have to do anything, it's like, it's, it looks like a war zone. It's so interesting how you can still nevertheless project a certain set of affects into sound where, I mean, certain sounds are more uncomfortable than others, or certain sounds are more pleasant than others. I mean, when I hear the, the shushka, the water mills, I mean, it's actually quite like, beautiful. Yes. You know, it's this kind of like, this, this, yeah, yeah, this yeah. rhythm is like techno, yeah. right? Um, but then you hear the pipeline and yeah. this kind of the screeching yeah. sound. I mean, I, we were kind of referring to it as each other as the saddest music in the world. Mm -hmm. you know, because it's this really like, what is this strange like, screeching? Mm -hmm. Almost like they were, there is something encoded in these sounds, but of course it's a beautiful <laughs> <of> projection. <laughs> But I, I hold on more to that aspect than to yeah. the kind of horror of an image somehow mm -hmm. that can easily just kind of pass through you. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Are there more questions, guys? Otherwise, I would say we have a glass of wine. No, no, it's a problem. I wanted to apologize. I mean, we're very specific that the sixth. Uh, Far closest, and they it's given in concession. They didn't allow us to open it for you, so you have to spread out and go in the neighborhood and try to notice. But uh, thank you very, very much for coming. There is good. No, 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 no,